say is that language um, is that language is refuge. It is it is uh, it is a space for it is a public space yes. for private experience. I think that is typically what I imagine um, my favorite poems are. They are public spaces uh, like religious structures. Anyone is welcome at any time. And we have our uh, internal experience inside of shared space. It may not be you know, temporarily immediate. Um, you know, you, John, could read a poem that I read last week and we're connected in our privacies somehow um, by virtue of having shared that experience. That's, that's a form of, uh, of refuge, certainly. I think I'm speaking in a very disorganized way about this matter. Well, because well no, I think it's great. I, I, I think you, you know, one, one is, I, I think part of it is, I, I, I like the kind of brokenness of some of the, those physical objects and, you know, what, what they may show you or inform you. So how does that, it seems like you've got two, you know, streams of consciousness is going on. How does that, or does that show up in some of your poems? You know, there's the more physical world, then there's this brokenness of, yeah. of making you realize something different, or I don't know, maybe I'm interpreting. If I'm not interpreting right, just tell me. No, you are. You're, uh, I guess the, what I wanted to say about the condition of brokenness is the extent to which it reveals the indeterminate to us. I think indeterminacy is one of the chief elements of my experience of the world. The contingent components of, of, of all things that are beyond my control. I mean, I don't even know what is in my control, to be direct. I mean, the extent to I can't control my own ideation. I can't control my own responses. Not really. I mean, my reflexive reactions to the world are, are so, um, so instantaneous that they, they betray any fiction I may. I mean, yeah, it's true. Somebody may insult me. I don't have to like resort to violence, but the injury is, is involuntary. You know, what I receive in the insult. My work addresses these things only obliquely, but I think what it does is it plunges me into the indeterminate and allows me to be guided by uh, an experience of sensibility that seems like a force uh, of, of some kind of control. Um, I think I find refuge in the act of working. I have a friend, uh, a poet named Matthew Yeager, who once observed that in some measure, at least this was true at this time, I think in my, in my writing life, that my poems were, were, were sort of like spells. Um, they, they were interested in constructing an atmosphere of, of hypnotic um, stability. Uh, and yeah, there may be some agitation necessarily. I mean, any form of pattern is only interesting because it's troubled by the, the, the threat of its absence, you know, the breakdown of a pattern. Um, I think the act of writing is also kind of auto-hypnotic for me. Uh, and so it serves as a way to, to break the things I think I understand and perceive their, uh, their indeterminate nature but also to encompass me in the, in the, in the deliberative and, and nearly meditative uh, act of, of contemplation. And that could be something as simple as, as reaching for a sound pattern, as asking a question of the world, the answer to which I don't know, but will be led by virtue of having raised it in text. Um, so I would say those two halves, the, the brokenness and the sort of peaceful and closed are definitely active in my, in my writing process. And in some cases, uh, in the in the in the subjects I address, I, you know, I have a certain tendency. I would even say an enthusiasm for a, a, a subset of literary practice in the in the lyric tradition that's devotional. Um, I'm not. Uh, I don't know how interesting this is to anybody in the room. It's, there are very few of us, so it seems like I can speak freely. Um, you know, I I was not raised with a particularly well defined religious tradition, and that means that my engagement with matter spiritual is uh is liberated I, you know there's no there's no orthodoxy against which i have to um define myself and that allows my excursions in the devotion not to suggest that anybody who has a very clear yeah. set of answers to these things can't also be provided with novel information but the limited degree to which i can depend on answers that have been provided to me by someone else allows me to be inside of the space of of quandary and query and i find that to be uh, a great source of refuge for me. And even just reaching in that direction 
is, uh, is stabilizing and providing purpose and also in orienting me away from that space of completely contingent world, you know, my own decay, uh, the frustrations of, of, uh, of, of temporal life, you know, the political moment. Um, many of these things are persistent elements. I don't mean to diminish, you know, any discrete part there, but I, I love, you know, being next to an enormous cedar that is older than, than, you know, that was born before Jesus. <laughs> this, you know, in the Sierra Nevadas, you can stand next to a tree that, that predates Julius Caesar. Um, that, that grounds me, you know, when I can look into the ocean and I can see an undulation that, that, that predates uh, the cells that are um, contained in my own body, I, I, I find something, something liberating there. I think, you know, poems can be that kind of telescopic mechanism for approaching those, um, those parts of the world and, and thinking about their, um, their, their foundations. So is there a poem or two you could share with us? Yeah, uh, yeah, I was trying to think about how, how I wanted to organize it. I really decided in the end that I was just going to go go free. I, I would be happy to read from my own work, but I, maybe I'll start with something. Yeah, start with something else. So, you know, listen, it's a, this, is a, this year is a little bit more, it's more of a conversation. Yeah. And we want to we wanna hear what you think about things and how you're, you know, as I said, the connective tissue or, or I like the... Uh, you know, the brokenness and the indeterminate uh, nature of things. I'm right, I write notes down here because they're great little snippets of uh, information. No, I think it's great. I, I, we're just trying to understand this. You know, I feel like we're, we're peeling back the curtain and understanding the, uh, cre we're seeing the creative dynamic of, of some of this. And it's, I think it's fantastic. Oh, well, that's, that's it's thrilling to hear. I think uh, it's always more rewarding to be inside of the the quandary and the question, and to be inside of the answer. Um, this is a poem by Jericho Brown. Uh, it's a it's a newer poem of his. It has not been collected yet, um, but it was featured in the New York Times back in October 2019. It's entitled the uh, Excuse me. It's just crossing. The water is one thing, and one thing for miles. The water is one thing, making this bridge built over the water another. Walk it early. Walk it back when the day grows dim, everyone rising just to find a way toward rest again. We work, start on one side of the day, like a planet's only sun, our eyes straight until the flame sinks. The flame sinks. Thank God I'm different. I've figured and counted. I'm not crossing to cross back. I'm set on something vast. It reaches long as the sea. I'm more than a conqueror, bigger than bravery. I don't march. I'm the one who leaps. Nice, nice. I think of... Uh, the poles of refuge and witness, as I said to you, John on the phone, as somewhat opposed in my own understanding, in my own practice, I think sometimes poetry is a space for the refuge of my, my witness. Um, but sometimes poetry is um, the witness of refuge, and sometimes poetry is um, the refuging witness. Uh, and I think what, what happens in Jericho's poem there is that the, the sense of scope is connected to the details of history and our present moment in a way that is expansive and stabilizing, but still unsure. It's encouraging in the most etymologically rooted sense of that word. It provides us heart. It gives heart to us. Um, and I find it, I, I find it a kind of miracle <laughs> to have these objects in the world. Yeah. So let's let you switch gears for a minute and and you know, talk about witnessing. And I'll, I'll give you an example from, uh, um, I'll think of her name in a minute. Yeah, Julie Danho. So one, one of her poems, I guess it's actually true, you know, she's on a bus ride and someone's getting murdered in an alley. Hmm. And, you know, the refuge, I guess, of being behind the glass and not being in real life, you know, there, it was an interesting, there's an interesting juxtaposition between being safe 
and having seeing someone, you know, unfortunately about to lose their life. It was just wasn't planned that way. It was just a, a, a shocking connection of of time and space. So what's the uh, you know, what are your thoughts about you know witnessing? As I understand the concept most commonly uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the literary context, it, it has to do with a kind of uh, an act of um, anguished memorialization of, uh, of destruction by socio-political forces. Um, that is, I think, a real tension in a lot of the poems that I most adore is the extent to which uh, engagement is in the sideline, you know, in the, in the foreground, in the background. Um, I guess I, I myself, I struggle somewhat to imagine um, myself as witness. I think of myself more as as an organ of perception, indeed, but not as uh, a recorder in that way. Um, I guess I, I, I still find that I am unclear on the nature of my own ontology <laughs> in some way. Yep. I, you know, there's a, my wife is Lithuanian. Um, she was born in Lithuania, a very small nation state. Very few people even know where it is on the map. It's adjacent to Belarus, which is undergoing some, some pretty um, powerful political uh, yeah. uh, complexities at this moment. Um, her exposure to, she, you know, she was not, she didn't really experience the, the Soviet era. Um, Lithuania was the first Soviet satellite nation in Northern Europe to, to, to separate um, they declared independence in 1992. Yeah, the Berlin Wall had already fallen, but in terms of this like hegemonic sphere of Soviet influence, Lithuania was the first to to express its um, its will to 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 autonomy, to self determination. And uh, John, I think some, some very interesting. Oh, I see that your door has opened. Oh. We were uh, yeah, yeah, our dog. Uh, hear it. Our dog's always looking. Uh, uh, Shiba Uno. They. They have their own way of doing things, and they, they don't usually respond to commands. <laughs> yeah. I'll just tell you that. It was wonderfully mysterious. Yeah. Um, it's interesting for me to think about the, the nature of, of witness in this context. You know, this was a totalitarian state. Um, hundreds of thousands of people were being shipped off to the gulag or, or shot in prison yards. Um, the, and different ethnic groups were forcibly um, uh, oppressed. Um, you know, like the, the sheer quantity of, of mass murder in, in the territory of this really small country, it's got a landmass about the size of um, uh, maybe like Rhode Island, you know, population the size of, of Kansas. Um, it's, uh, I mean, smaller than San Diego, where I live. Um, I, I, I've paid close attention to the function of literature there. You know, Carolyn Forche is the is the is the the spirit behind the contribution of the poetry of witness, so far as I understand it. Um, and the poetry of witness within her representation would be poets who are recording atrocities, um, crimes against humanity, indignities, and uh, and and forms of um, of depravity and cruelty that mandate some form of resistance. Um, in Lithuania, it is the case that there were some underground artists who were, who were working in opposition. But the main way literature functioned in the Soviet period in Lithuania, and I'm not saying this is true all over the world, but it was to preserve some trace of interiority that was separate from the totalitarian regime. Everybody inside of the USSR was supposed to speak Russian. This was the language of empire. And they wanted to eradicate um, native populations, any sense of distinctive ethnic identity. So they would say, for example, Lithuania will still be on the map, but Lithuanians will no longer be present in it. Um, they exported Russians and all government officials would you know, only uh, engage in, 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 in Russian fluency. So to write at all in the local tongue was to provide some sense of separation from the political sphere. It was a radical act of, of, of rebellion, but it was a turning inward. 
um, a turning inward and away from the, the indignities of the external world. That was the extent to which liberty was possible. You know, you couldn't flee. You weren't allowed to, to leave. The, the border was impermeable. Um, and, and that, I don't know if that counts as an act of witness in a way, but what it does do is, is provide um, a sense of concentrated difference from the torments of the world. Uh, so, you know, to what extent do I engage in acts of witness? I don't know. I, I I don't think that I I don't think that's that's part of my strong suit. Actually, I think yeah. I still question the nature of my perception. It's hard for me to render it with the confidence that I'm making a contribution um, just by describing what I see. Um, yeah. I think there's a lot more power and confidence in the poets whom Forche collects and and people in the world now who are uh, who are capable of. <clears throat> of reporting on that witness. I, I, I think of myself as somebody who's, yeah, we challenged to perceive at all. Yeah, I always wonder, I think during COVID, I think of, I've tried to be more of a self-witness, <clears throat> you know, about what I'm doing and why. I don't think I'm always successful. I'm just wondering what you, you know, I, I think part of it, all these things have so many dimensions. You know, if you're, you know, for me, just being more present and aware, I feel as my own version of, of just witnessing in the moment, because all I've got here is the dog and the snow on the ground outside. So, uh, so are there other, are there poems that, that, you know, in your, you know, that you'd like to share around witnessing? And once again, we'd love to hear wow. some of your own work too, and additional things you want to share. I think this is sort of maybe a blend of of refuge and witness. I don't know if this, I don't know to what extent this will persuade anybody. This is a poem by A.R. Ammons entitled um, The City Limits. When you consider the radiance that, is, that it does not withhold itself but pours its abundance without selection into every nook and cranny not overhung or hidden, when you consider that birds' bones make no awful noise against the light, but lie low in the light as in a high testimony. When you consider the radiance that it will look into the guiltiest swervings of the weaving heart and bear itself upon them, not flinching into disguise or darkening. When you consider the abundance of such resource as illuminates the glow blue bodies and gold skeined wings of flies swarming the dumped guts of a natural slaughter or the coil of shit and in no way winces from its storms of generosity. When you consider that air or vacuum, snow or shale, squid or wolf, rose or lichen, each is accepted into as much light as it will take. Then the heart moves roomier, the man stands and looks about, the leaf does not increase itself above the grass, and the dark work of the deepest cells is of a tune with may bushes and fear lit by the breadth of such calmly turns to praise. Whoa. That was a good one. I think very it's nice. Fantastic. I, you know, it's tr trying to bridge that that difference. I, you know, in a way, okay. In a way, I think the distinction between refuge and witness, such as I understand it, is that is the difference between imminence and, and transcendence. You know, how much does um, being inside of the moment connect us to our larger purpose, and how much does being above our moment constitute the larger purpose? I mean, those are two poles yeah. in operation. You know, these axes are are in contest from the beginning. And uh, I mean, we have to be like abacus beads sliding constantly between one end of that extremity and the other, um, bearing witness to some moments out of our conviction of the essential nature of, 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 of participating in the perceptive act in those moments, contributing to the larger, you know, sort of collective vision, and then moments where, where we have to bend out and, and turn away from it. Um, I think for me, in the end, both of these things are, 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 are forms of... Uh, engagement and alleviation in, in alternate strokes. And I think that poem does a great job of kind of yeah. an abacus beat back and forth and um, aggrandizing the act of witness and um, providing refuge from it all at the same time. Somebody maybe wanted me to read that poem again. I, I definitely can do that. Yeah, yeah. Keith, if you, yeah, I could even share the screen if you want. That'd be um, great. I don't know how to do that entirely. Uh, you may not be able to do it if you're not the host. So you can just read it or okay, also read just it. type it, type in the name of the poem also. It's entitled The City Limits. Oh, City Limits. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's A-R-Ammons, A-M-M-O-N-S. 
When you consider the radiance that it does not withhold itself, but pours its abundance without selection into every nook and cranny, not overhung or hidden. When you consider that birds' bones make no awful noise against the light, but lie low in the light as in a high testimony. When you consider the radiance, that it will look into the guiltiest swervings of the weaving heart and bear itself upon them, not flinching into disguise or darkening. When you consider the abundance of such resource as illuminates the glow blue bodies and gold skeined wings of flies swarming the dumped guts of a natural slaughter or the coil of shit and in no way winces from its storms of generosity. When you consider that air or vacuum, snow or shale, squid or wolf, rose or lichen, each is accepted into as much light as it will take. Then the heart moves roomier. The man stands and looks about. The leaf does not increase itself above the grass. And the dark work of the deepest cells is of a tune with may bushes. And fear, lit by the breadth of such, calmly turns to praise. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. yeah. Fantastic poem. Um, I think the element of, of imminence and, uh, well, the, the poles of imminence and transcendence in, in, in that poem seem to me really active and um, it allows me to participate in, uh, in the work of, uh, of blessing somehow, yeah. you know, I feel, I feel the, 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 the power of um, the miraculous and the horrifying both in, in that, in that mix. Mm. Nice. Really nice. So is there a poem or two of yours that you could read for us? Sure. Yeah. I, but my thought was, uh, as I said, that I would just kind of lean into some of the work that might be more. Oh, no, no, that's great. Listen, I, I listen, I'm, um, no, We're no, doing no. different things this year, so it's fantastic. Absolutely. Absolutely. That City Limits fun is, uh, yeah, it's great. So I'm going to read uh, a poem entitled uh, Entering St. Patrick's Cathedral. That's in your book, right? Uh, no, this is my second book, which is... Okay. Yeah, I still got the first one. Yeah. being uh, developed. Um, okay. I mean, if you're, if, if I could read from the first, no, I, no, I, read that, read, no, read what you're going to read, read what you're going to read. Entering St. Patrick's Cathedral. I have carried in my coat, black wet with rain. I stand, I clear my throat. My coat drips. The carved door closes on its slow brass hinge. City noises, car horns, Bicycle bells, the respiration of truck engines, the wintry feel in midtown taxi brakes, bend in through the door jam with the wind, then drop away. The door shuts plumb. It seals the world out like a coffin lid. A chill, dampened and dense with the spent breath of old Hail Marys, lifts from the smoothed stone of the nave. I am here to pay my own respects, but I will wait. My eyes must grow accustomed to church light, watery and dim. I step in. Dark forms hunch forward in the pews, whispering their heads are bowed, their mouths pressed to the hollows of clasped hands. High overhead, a gathering of shades glows in stained glass. The resurrected mingle with the dead and martyred in panes of blue, green, yellow, red. Beneath them lies the golden holy altar, holding its silence like a bell. And there, brightly skeletal beside it, the organ pipes, cold, chrome, quiet, but alive with the vibration tolling out from the incarnate source of holy sound. I turn, shivering back into my coat. The vaulted ceiling bends above me like an ear. It waits. I hold my tongue. My body is my prayer. So, 
So I think you might be able to see in a poem like that some some pivot into and out of the nature of uh, worldly or embodied experience, um, some some tension perhaps between the act of witness and the, and the hope for refuge. I'm not sure to what extent that uh, entirely illuminates the predicament such as I experience it, but it's one of the ways that uh, that my work attempts to to contend with the challenges of uh, yeah that oscillating or um, the abacus the abacus yeah exactly. So you're you're teaching some classes now, right? Yeah. So what what uh, maybe give us a, just a summary, a, a lesson or guidance you would give your students? You know, are they? I'll tell you. I'll tell you, John. I think the hardest thing in uh, so I'm teaching one class that is a, a poetry writing class and one class that is a poetry study class, and in both instances, I think the hardest thing is to, to coach the students to feel comfortable entering the space of not knowing. Um, John Keats has this, this, you know, when he was engaged in his autodidactic study of the history of literature, he proposes in a letter to his brother that what makes Shakespeare a valuable writer, finally, is what Keats describes as negative capability, which is the ability to, to, to be in the face of uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching after fact or reason. Um, in other words, like the, the, the capacity to recognize that the world can contain an Iago, a Desdemona, and an Othello all at the same time in the same place. And there's no simplification. The total complexity of the existence of an Iago, the existence of a Desdemona, and the existence of an Othello is what Shakespeare allows. He doesn't tell us how the world is. He renders the world as it is in its mysterious multiplicity. When my students are learning how to command the tools of literature, one of the challenges for them is to not begin from a thesis-oriented uh, position. You know, if, you're, if one is engaged in, in a work of literature and they're trying to make a, demonstrate a case rather than learn how a case can be made, then the poem is sort of dead from, from the get-go. There's no mystery in it. It's, it's a didactic exercise. That makes it more of, a, a, of, of an expository exercise and yeah. less of an aesthetic one. Um, likewise, in the students on the, on, the, on the reading level, you know, they're so hungry always to elude the experience of not knowing, you know, and that the thrill of literary analysis is, is being faced with an indeterminacy that mirrors our own experience on earth and having to slowly, you know, step by step engage in a kind of slalom shaped descent into a world where we just begin to discern patterns and, and correspondences um, and as to use a phrase from Mark Strand, all but partial meanings. You know, but we can see the, the shadows of the forms interconnected and then suddenly it's a lattice work and it, it is something we can climb. And then it turns out to have been a shadow all along and we're back on the ground and we're looking up into the trees of, um, of, of, of our unknowing and hoping we can ascend them in some way. So I love teaching literature uh, and I love teaching print specifically, hard copy. I think in the digital world, um, we've arrived at a place where, uh, where tangibility and the stillness of, of the analog experience is, uh, is alien to a lot of students. You know, the internet for them is not, it's not adjacent to the world. It's not an addendum to it. It is a fully integrated expression of what is reality. People who remember the acquisition of computers in their lives, I think have a really hard time imagining that the, the space of the digital, the agitated pixel is anything but um, you know, an adjacent space. There's the real world and then there's the digital world. But for my students now who have no, you know, who were born after 9-11, you know, these kids, they, they don't know anything other than the internet as, as part of the round experience of the globe. It's fully integrated. You know, my relationships are via this ungrammatical text this emoji, or okay, who uses those anymore? Very few, I guess. But um, you know, this 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 physical meeting, um, they they're agitated by the inability to be uh, to be distracted from the moment. And uh, I think the indeterminate nature of literary textuality, grounded in the space of the page, insists on their being totally present in a space beyond their conceptual control. 
and that I think is 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 a great source of liberation. Uh, so I love I love, I'm a prophet of, the, of of print, and I'm a I'm a prophet of unknowing and to the extent that I can succeed in in those initiatives. That's what I think of myself as doing. I'm I'm proselytizing for you know I'm teaching an honors class right now at the lower division level. And I asked on the first day, this is the honor students who enrolled in a literature course. How many of them had read a book 300 pages or, or, or longer in the last year? Um, there are 20 students in the room, and there was not a single raised hand. Um, you know, I almost, I almost engulfed myself in flames as a result of that thing. These are these are like the leading minds in my institution, um, and and where where are they going to be leading us if they can't sit quietly and read a 300 page? book, not even a novel. You know, I wasn't saying, hey, guys, go spend some time with Toni Morrison or Faulkner where the language can be weird. And, you know, that's not that I just any 300 page book, even on business, you know, something as orderly as an accounting manual is too much for them. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, I find that uh, I find that teaching literature provides an almost uh, spiritual encounter with the other because you both you both find yourself like uh, Dante the Pilgrim, you know, in the dark wood, and you're not sure who's, no one's necessarily going to come and save you. Um, it's, it's just about getting comfortable with the, the furniture of, of sound and form, um, the unknown voice to, to learn to, to be attuned to a, a new expression of, of, of human being um, through, through the, the, the lyric space. Um, so yeah, those are the two things I'm teaching right now, but I, I find uh, each of them to be a way to remind myself about that oscillate, you know, the abacus bead and, and how to try to uh, be variable in my situation there in a, in a flexible way. Yeah, here's Keith Curtis. He said, yeah, yeah he quoted us directly from, um, from Keats. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's there in the chat. Yeah, it's really nice. I agree with him entirely. That is the heart of the mystic, absolutely. Um, but it's also, you know, it's also, I think the heart of, uh, I think Keats was absolutely right in that diagnosis. You know, there are, we can turn to literature for a number of reasons. Um, and I guess maybe implicit in a lot of the, the, the conversation we've had so far today, John, is, is, the, is the sense that I have that um, I'm not confident that my answers are, are valid for anyone other than me. And my answers are also, they're so, they're often brief, you know, the points of stability, the points of conviction at which I arrive, there are certain continuities, certain moral codes, for example, that I have found are not, they're not modulating that much. I mean, the core architecture is the same. Then maybe the rooms are redecorated sometimes or like they get a renovation, but you know, core ethical principles, I have not found to be so fluctuating in the course of my life. But my answers to other things, like how we implement modes of living that are consistent with my moral code, that stuff changes. Um, my ideas of what good and evil are, that can be situational. You know, There are times where I might forgive something under one set of circumstances that in another I would regard as completely reprehensible. That challenges me to recognize with humility the limited extent to which I am a capable source for resolving the problems of others. And, and that, that means that I always have to be inside of, of negative capability. And it means that when I'm reading, I'm not interested in anybody telling me what will be true for me. I'm interested in helping, I'm interested in being led to a space where I have once again to try to figure things out for myself. <laughs> and I think, you know, in a way, that's what the that, that's how I experience. Uh, Jericho Brown's poem this morning. That's how I experience A.R. Ammons's poem. They're both offering frames, but more than anything, you know, they're leading us to a place where we can perceive a totality, um, experience a, a response, and interrogate ourselves to the extent to which you know we're involved in the same exercise, or how we can arrive at a place uh, where we're comparably disposed to the, the the speaking voices in those poems. So Malachi. Uh... <clears throat> So for your students that haven't read a 300 page book plus and, and that are locked into the digital world, you know, at some point does the whole thing, I don't know, explode or dissolve for them that there's, there is that other world that's, you know, paper and pen or, you know, I guess the question is, do they stay in that world or do they start to explore that unknown territory? Yeah, well, I mean, it's definitely a case by case situation. I, yeah. I don't allow my students to use uh, digital mechanisms or, or machines in, in the classroom when we're, when we're in these classes. 
Um, you know, elaborate notes taken is not a requirement. So we're there to, to be inside of our bodies, um, which is the, the main thing to which literature appeals. It's not only, you know, the mind. I think of digital space as, as an increasingly disembodied space, but the nature of, of a set <coughs> is, is, is sensuous. One of the pleasures of poetry is, 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 the, is the sound of words, the textures of words in our mouths, the rhythms as they play upon our pulses, again, to invoke Keats, but our sense of, of um, bodily participation in the rhythmic unfolding of time, um, the, the, the recognition of, uh, of sensory experience as they are evoked for us by texts, just a beautiful sense of, of plenitude or you know, particular fruit and the experience of tasting that fruit. Um, that's, that can be a gift, but all these things are feeding into embodied experience. And yeah, it's conscious embodied experience, obviously. Um, but those, I think those students, when they become willing to, 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 to experience um, embodied language, then they become nourished by it and they, and they regard it as a, as a form of counterpoint to the more um, engrossing digital space. You know, it's easy, it's so easy and so comfortable to be distracted. Um, I, I mean, that's a, a point Pascal makes. I, I actually, I find his pensées to be really challenging to enjoy in English at least, or maybe in French they're beautiful, but it's like, to me, it's like eating slate. Um, but he makes some beautiful observations. And one of them is the, the agitated foundation of human consciousness, how eager we are to escape ourselves and, you know, there are various forms of intoxication that, that are available to us always at every moment. But, um, you know, maybe more, more, more nuanced forms of intoxication would be, uh, you know, being preoccupied with, uh, with things that, that lead our attention away from, from, from maybe our, our most profound concerns, you know, uh, deadlines, um, my water bill. You know, I love to call the San Diego Water Department. They're always uh, giving me a reason to, to, to think about something other than, you know, how I can contribute to a righteous outcome for the world or, um, you know, what I need to do to, to put my own uh, house in, in more proper order or, um, you know, how I can be of service to my neighbor or, you know, all, the, all, these, all these, these profound quandaries um, and the students, uh, you know, sometimes they opt against it and sometimes they, they want to explain the mysteries of text away by grounding these things um, definitively in, uh, in historical circumstances or, you know, I think of, of Sylvia Plath as a great emblem of a kind of injustice that can be done by students who don't want to live in the mysterious nature of the spaces she's created. They want to say, look, this is weird because she was weird, right? Or ah, she was crazy, you know? So all of this stuff is just attributable to, to mental instability. Um, that's a way of eluding the, the, the experience of, um, of, of the deliberative process that led her to produce those objects yeah. uh, that we can, we can engage with together. Um, so, so no, some of them are along for the ride and some of them, you know, some of them are, uh, some of them are ready to be, to be swallowed by, uh, by the machine in a deeper way or by, by maybe a, a larger and more nefarious state. I'm really disconcerted. I don't want to sound like, you know, it's no Jeremiah. I love my students and I find them to be phenomenal. Many years ago, I was startled to read in Horace, um, you know, sort of, uh, 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 Augustine era Roman poet that that even then people were lamenting the condition of the youth. You know this narrative of like <laughs> so it's a, this millennia long tradition from the prophets of the Old Testament through Horace all the way to my father now is like these young people you know they don't know anything. I think I'm like God you know this man he 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 could probably learn from them as much as I can, um, but I do perceive a surprising uh, sense of ennui maybe in or or maybe it's a uh, overwhelmedness, you know, they, they, they struggle to look things up. Um, they have the most powerful information generating or, or you know, the most immediate and, and most enormous uh, uh, exposure to the world of knowledge in their pockets at all times, these little smartphones that are connected to the internet. There's no question that they might start with outside of core, you know, mystical or metaphysical questions that can't be answered by that phone. And yet they'll read a poem that involves, say, a howitzer. And when I say, all right, let's, before we even talk about anything else, let's just let's just get some of the facts out of the way. What's a howitzer? And they're all like, you know, I don't know. I didn't look it up. And I think, my God, what kind of civic presence will you have if you can't if you can't even inquire into the, the very simplest things you don't know? makes me worried for, for our future and for, for the stability of a, of a resistant 
uh, mechanism. And uh, and so the students who are with me, I think, yeah, these are these are students who who might be able to um, might be able to you know to build a fire, <laughs> a spiritual fire or or uh, you know fire of the mind um, at any time. And then the students who want to just slide into uh, into their uh, you know TikTok accounts. Um, as 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 early as possible, I, I fear for them in some ways, for the fullness of the lives they will lead, for the fullness of the lives of those who depend on them. Um, but uh, you know, but I have hope for all. So yeah, they're they're mostly they, I would say almost entirely along for the ride. There are only a few who you know for whom I, I, I yeah. Fear. Listen, life is a series of unfolding events. So you know, at some point in time. Maybe another layer of the onion will will dissolve, and they will. And I don't know when you're talking. All I could think about is the new Matrix movie coming out. <laughs> Listen, you know, I how, the, the, an executive from the company formerly known as Facebook on the radio just I don't know ten or twelve days ago talking about the metaverse, and I uh, I don't know. I was I felt like maybe I should turn around and drive as fast as I could into the ocean. Because I, I really, I don't want to live in a in a world where people are sitting on their couches with the, you know, with the Oculus on and like pretending to go to the grocery store. Um, this just seems like this seems like my my worst nightmare, really. Um, yeah, well, yeah, and somehow uh, people uh, kneel at that altar every day, and uh, yeah. So we we only have about ten minutes left. Is there another? A uh, poem or two you want to share? You know, anything yeah, sure. from your 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 uh, Malachi Wikipedia land of things that are good or you that you'd like to share? Oh yeah, I'm happy to read. Uh, I'm happy to read any number of things that that uh, that. Here's whatever uh, you like. Whatever you like. This is a poem I love. It's I think she's a terribly underrated uh, poet, um, May Swenson. Uh, I think she, you know, she was once relatively prominent, but upon her death, it seems that very few people keep up with her now. She does have a Library of America edition. This is probably her best known or most anthologized poem, but I think it's lovely and it's a beautiful introduction to um, the, the, the sensuous fullness of her work. It's entitled, did, you say May? did you say May Swenson? Swenson, yes. Yeah, I think of, I don't know, didn't she have a poem about baseball or something? I'm trying to think of it. There's, uh, I've read some of her stuff. I just can't. I'll have to go back and look at it. I recommend her strenuously. I think she's phenomenal. Um, so this is her poem question. Body, my house, my horse, my hound. What will I do when you are fallen? Where will I sleep? How will I ride? What will I hunt? Where can I go without my mount, all eager and quick? How will I know in thicket ahead is danger or treasure? When body, my good bright dog is dead, how will it be to lie in the sky without roof or door and wind for an eye? With cloud for shift, how will I hide? Nice. I'll also read, this is, you know, this is a text to which I reach often when, I, when I'm seeking refuge. I'm just going to read the second half of it. Um, I adore William Butler Yeats. Uh, I think he's hilarious and uh, highly eccentric and in a really endearing way. Um, I also think, you know, his, his capacity with the declarative sentence, the kind of um, etched quality of his verse, always something that appeals to me. But sometimes I think his eccentricities do not reward uh, many contemporary readers. However, the second section of a dialogue of self and soul, I think, is is magnificent, and it's something to which I turn, as I said, when I'm seeking refuge from witness or you know a, an opportunity to witness refuge. <clears throat> this is again second the uh, second section of a dialogue of self and soul by William Butler Yeats, and I'll read um, the, these little italics uh, only as a sort of implied, as you can tell from the title. The structure of the poem is a uh, you know, series of interlocutions between a, a self speaking and a soul. The second section is all the self. So actually that's all I'm gonna say about it. A living man is blind and drinks his drop. What matter if the ditches are impure? 
What matter if I live it all once more? Endure that toil of growing up, the ignominy of boyhood, the distress of boyhood changing into man, the unfinished man and his pain brought face to face with his own clumsiness. The finished man among his enemies? How in the name of heaven can he escape that defiling and disfigured shape the mirror of malicious eyes casts upon his eyes until at last he thinks that shape must be his shape? And what's the good of an escape if honor find him in the wintry blast? I am content to live it all again and yet again if it be life to pitch into the frog spawn of a blind man's ditch, a blind man battering blind men, or into that most fecund ditch of all, the folly that man does or must suffer if he woos a woman proud, not kindred of his soul. I am content to follow to its source every event in action or in thought, measure the lot, Forgive myself the lot. When such as I cast out remorse, so great a sweetness flows into the breast. We must laugh and we must sing. We are blessed by everything. Everything we look upon is blessed. Mm. Fantastic. Well, I think uh, we're, we're getting close to the end of the hour. And I know you've got to go uh, teach those people who are living in another world. So uh, <laughs> I don't know. I was probably would have been like that if I was in a poetry class. I should have done more poetry when I was an undergrad. I, I think I was just, why am I in college? I don't know. Everyone's going to college. So that's why I went to college. <laughs> well, you're making up for, if there was a lack of poetry in your youth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 in, a, in, a, I'm in a long, I'm in a three-year poetry class. We're in year two. So okay. uh now, Malachi, fantastic. Uh, you know, thank you for, uh, you know, not coloring within the lines and just, uh, and Angela, I think Peter, uh, you know, our future speakers, as I said before, this is more of a conversation that can, you know, kind of go wide or, or, or deep, depending on, on how you interpret certain things. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping it's, uh, it gives you the, you know, or the freedom to express yourself and, and, uh, you know, setting, you know, instead of standing up in front of a room and reading for your poems and, and having people clap, this is, I, I don't know, to me, this is a little more intriguing and, and definitely more exciting with some of the, the you know, the, uh, you know, the words you've given us. So, well, and, uh, I feel yeah. that it's disorganized and uh, improvisatory uh, hour, but I, I think it's probably more honest than anything I could have offered uh, in any alternative way. Yeah. Great. Sorry there. I didn't mute my phone before. No, thank you again. Angela, good to see you. Uh, Peter, good to not see you, but uh, see your name on there. And uh, Keith, I hope you come back. We'll have another session next week. Hey, Peter. Peter, I think you're, what happened? You, uh, okay, we got to raise money for our Peter haircut fund. I think Peter, it's getting, uh, you know, it's only, only kidding. Little, little, little Thursday humor. Uh, no, it's great, everybody. Uh, next week, uh, we have Dane Servine at, at, uh, at 12 o'clock. And uh, Keith, if you want to be on our list for future events, just put your email in the chat box right now. And I'll you know, put you on the list. And you'll, you'll get a little note with the Zoom invite. But Angela, we look forward to uh, having you, I guess, at the beginning of the year, right? Yeah, in January. Great. Okay, everybody. Uh, Malachi, thanks again. My pleasure. Thank you, John. Yep. Yep. Great. And answer is January 13th. Okay. Very good. Let me get this. I got to crap to this email. Uh, great. Good. Okay. <laughs>